Uh, this is my buddy John. John and I met uh, 10 minutes ago. Uh, been friends a long time. We hit it off instantly. Uh, I know where John works and his likes and dislikes and all those kind of things, right? It's true. It's true. It's very true. Um, I will say that I actually don't know what you're going to talk about. Um, so I'm very excited to learn <laughs> what, what it is. Um, uh, with that, uh, John, is this your first time speaking at ShmooCon? Uh, first time speaking at any conference. In the mic. Oh. First time speaking at any conference. Woo! Well, welcome to a plenary session of the entire conference. What could be more <laughs> nerve-wracking than that? Anyway, uh, big warm uh, greeting for John once again. So thanks for coming. Thanks for this being your inaugural event. And uh, we get to look at Bob's back while he sorts this out. So anyway, without further ado, John. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, Shmukan. Uh, I'm going to give him one more second because half my slides are kind of not on the screen. So. Oh, those are okay. Oh, all right. That's great. All right. That works then. Uh, I'm John Amirzvani, and I'm here to talk to you today about, today about ad laundering and how bribes and backdoors play a role in that process. Uh, a little bit about who I am real quick. Um, I'm an alumni of the White Hatters Computer Security Club from the University of South Florida and a security researcher with Novetta. I've been in security for about 10 years. So let's start with how I first discovered uh, what was the ad laundering campaign. Uh, as many great things do, it started with a Reddit thread. And uh, actually, a good friend of mine sent me a Reddit thread one day out of the blue when I was homesick. And he basically told me, hey, isn't this a funny story? And it sounds real sketchy. And it was a, it was a thread about, uh, I believe it was like a sysadmin who came home one day to suddenly find a Raspberry Pi plugged into his network out of the blue and was kind of freaking out about it. And he confronted his roommate. And his roommate told him, oh, yeah, these great people on the internet told me if I plug this into the network, they will pay me $15 a week. Isn't that great? And um, as you can imagine, this guy is like, his head, basically his head exploded and was like, are you kidding me? What is this? What's happening? Um, so uh, yeah. And effectively, he went down this long rabbit hole of trying to figure out how they were mon trying to monetize and um, basically just like trash trashing this Raspberry Pi. And I started looking into that. And I was thinking, this sounds really weird, first of all. Like, who, who is this and what are they doing? And, and how exactly are they you know, monetizing uh, these users? And what is their income stream? So looking deeper into uh, topics related to this, I ended up coming across another uh, Reddit thread, actually, where a user was like, hey, this company wants to pay me money to use my Facebook account. Does that sound like a scam? And I <laughs> Yeah, you'd think it goes without saying, but uh, he had a, uh, it was like a legitimate question. It was under slash r slash scams. So he was in the right place asking the right question. And everyone was obviously like, definitely a scam, right? And I was really intrigued by this. I was like, wait, who is paying people to rent Facebook accounts? And, and what for, right? And the, as far back as I can tell, the earliest campaign that I've seen is from spring of 2016. So it's been going on for almost three years at this point that this technique has been, been applied to, uh, to Facebook users. Um, and, and the most interesting part about it to me is, is how brazen this cam these campaigns really are. Because it's not like a lot of other campaigns where they start off with like phishing and misleading and telling you you're going to win something weird. Up front, they actually explicitly say, you're going to give us your Facebook username and password. In return, we're going to buy ads on your account, and we will probably give you money. Right? And that's the contract that these, a lot of these people are signing up into. Um, the only, out of the many campaigns out there, I only really saw one that actually said the kind of ads they wanted to run, right? And in this case, they alleged that they were running like beauty, health, gold, and financial promotion ads. Um, the one interesting thing that they, that, that they mentioned as well later on is that they uh, are not willing to run mail enhancement uh, ads because those get taken down very quickly and burn the accounts. So at least Facebook's on the game about that. Anyways, uh, <laughs> enumeration. So there wasn't just one of these campaigns. There's a lot of them, and there's a lot of copycats, right? Um, so basically, uh, starting with just the one, I took a little bit of that, saw what they were, uh, kind of the, uh, 
from the promotional material, went and used that to find a lot of the other campaigns that used similar language. And what I realized was there was probably multiple different campaigns run by the same group, but then even within that there were distinct groups uh, with their own style and their own code. But I did see a lot of code reuse um, among some of the, the campaigns. And the, uh, the, these campa campaigns were typically promoted on social media. Uh, most of the leads I found were uh, through Facebook, Craigslist, and uh, I, f I forget, whatever the name was that social media platform Google had for a while, I, I really can't recall what it was called. But <laughs> whatever that was, there was some on there too. Uh, so it was pretty much like all over the internet. And here's the, the bribe portion, right? And so it turns out that although historically a lot of times these malicious campaigns have uh, sought to first to really fish users, take credentials of the account, kind of take it, um, they would take it and just do whatever they wanted and then they'd be done with it, right? Turns out for these types of campaigns, uh, that doesn't really work because you actually need the user's cooperation to some extent, right? Facebook specifically is actually pretty good at detecting when someone strange is logging into your Facebook account now, right? Like if you log in from a new IP or a new device at all, it, it pretty much flips out, flips out and like almost forces two-factor authentication on you if you have the app where it pops up and says you need to enter these digits, right? So it, they can't just take your credentials, log in from someone else, uh, somewhere else and, and do what they need to do. It'll, they'll get flagged and then all of the ads will get banned before they even get started. Um, so they've decided to make a deal with the users, right? Uh, by being mostly upfront with what they're doing and promising them two to five hundred dollars lump sum. Uh, in reality, what that, that's usually with the front page, right? And then what really happens is once the users actually give up all their data and install whatever the back door is, it usually drops down to what they call a verification stage, right? Where they say, oh, thanks for enrolling, we need to do additional verif- this is the the, the uh, ad launderer is saying this to the, to the uh, user, saying we need to do additional verification on your account before we can pay you your $500, but in the meantime, we'll kind of, you, know, uh, you know, trick you into staying and in keeping this because we'll give you $15, $25 a month, right? And, and uh, sometimes they do actually pay this out, but they'll typically never pay you the, the two to $500, right? Um, in the real, reality of this, uh, at most, you'll get a hundred bucks out of it. Some people, I think, have, and uh, you're very likely to get your Facebook account banned because as soon as your account is tied to one of these scam campaigns, they immediately kill the ad and they immediately the account's burned at that point, right? So they will ban your Facebook account. So some people don't care, but I think a lot of people, you know, have a lot of friends and, and whatnot on there. So it could be somewhat of a painful process. Of course, the the ad launderers tell you that it's totally legal. There's no issues at all, and they promise you the world. Um, there is the risk that in the future maybe law enforcement will get in law involved uh, and possibly legal as well uh, because in the, mon in the uh, money laundering world, money mules are often arrested as well depending on their role in the organization and what they were doing. You know, these organizations are approaching these people pretty full frontal and, almost, and explicitly telling them what's happening. There's really no deception involved, which is probably why they've, they've gotten away with staying around for so long on like, for example, the, the extension store. There's, it's full of these types of things, you know? Um, and probably because the users are actively opting into it. It's a, like they're voluntarily enrolling. Oh yeah, that's a user after they get banned. <laughs> so this is what the, the typical help wanted uh, ad looks like for uh, an, a potential ad mule. You know, any of you could sign up today probably. And uh, the requirements, typically one to two years, uh, one to two year old Facebook account, uh, 100 to 200 friends at, le at a minimum, no previous ad purchases on your account. Um, what's interesting is a lot of people don't realize that every single Facebook user automatically has access to the ad platform as well. Uh, so even if you've never done anything weird with your Facebook account, you could actually go to the ad section and just buy an ad probably in a matter of minutes, right? Um, but in this case, they want someone with no previous ads on their account because it can taint their, it basically they're assuming that if you have any ads on your account, you you're basically have already been used by some other ad launderer and they don't want it to taint and track their, uh, their campaigns, their, their campaigns together. And they'll also ask you for a PayPal account because that's how they, that's how they uh, allegedly pay you. 
and they will up front ask you for your Facebook username and password. And they do that to verify that you actually have a real Facebook account and password. Uh, and you also need to be gullible and probably greedy. So those are, that's kind of what the, uh, you know, an entry level ad mule looks like. Um, a lot of these requirements are actually derived from kind of the protections Facebook has put into place on their ad ecosystem. Uh, obviously they face a lot of backlash in the past few years over content that's been presented on their platform. So they've tightened down a little bit in order to make it a lot more difficult for fake accounts and kind of bots to y utilize their ad platform. Um, and one of the ways they've done that is by making it that uh, you need to have a, a one year minimum, the account has to have existed for at least one year. And you need to have, I think, at least 100 or 200 friends as well. And the more friends you have, the less suspicious it looks. Obviously, they have the ways of flagging accounts. If it's a, you know, 370 days that the account's been existed and has exactly 101 friends, and you immediately go to buy an ad on gold, like, that's the kind of thing that's probably pretty easily flagged. And, uh, and ultimately, this, this talk comes to the core of why they're doing this in the first place. That Facebook has made it difficult enough to create your own, basically harvest your own fake accounts, and that they're going to users to kind of do this dirty work for them. Uh, because there's that lead in period, right? You need to have an account that survives the one year mark, gains enough friends, and looks organic enough that it's not going to set off their alarms, that they'll lose their investments immediately. So the actual backdoors themselves, uh, there's two primary ways that I've seen so far that they typically will uh, interact and manipulate these the target users is self-infection is probably the most common. And basically they tell you, great, you've given us all your information. Now you're going to go into the, the Chrome web store and you're just going to install this Chrome extension that will basically man in the middle all of your traffic and prevent you from logging out and will like, you know, uh, block access to the ad platform so you can't see what kind of ads they're doing. Um, but other than that, the extensions themselves are honestly pretty, pretty bare bones, pretty simple. That said, they do check into their CT server every three to five minutes. And from there, the, the servers are able to give them additional commands and give, issue them new rules as well. So uh, basically, the rules of the game can change at any moment. Maybe the moment they realize your account is burned, they go after all your banking information, right? But they don't do, the, at least from what I've seen in my experience running these in a sandbox environment, they don't go after your, they don't do anything outside of Facebook day one. Um, at one point though, after running one of these for a week, I did see that it was trying to uh, look for certain Russian websites. So that was, that was kind of interesting, some social media, some Russian social media platforms. I did not explore what they would have done after that in terms of functionality, but that's, uh, that, that was an interesting point as well. And uh, the Chrome extensions tend to have a lot of overlapping code. It basically was like somebody wrote the bare bones template and then a lot of these guys who um, probably don't know JavaScript took it and tried to make it their own. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of a, a hilarious spaghetti code to read <laughs> because it's, there's a lot of basically copy and pasted code of like the same functions over and over again and like debugging messages like don't change this and like this one worked this time but not the other. It, it, it's, it's kind of a joke. Um, so clearly not very technically sophisticated but still surprisingly effective in their objectives. And over uh, the period of my research, I've uh, observed at least 3,000. If I had to guess, it's significantly higher. I only really took on uh, some sample size of the market. I, I didn't go out to enumerate every single campaign and observe every single one. And um, one of the ways I got these metrics was from, uh, so it turns out when your malware is, uh, in the Chrome store, you have really good metrics, public metrics on how many people are using it, <laughs> right? And then also, people can give feedback. <laughs> They're like, hey, your Trojan sucks, or uh, I don't like what it's doing to my computer. So there's all kinds of uh, uh, gems in, in, these, in these reviews, right? Uh, a lot of people complained about they weren't being paid on time, or uh, they wanted more money, or, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really interesting. And so it did really give kind of an, you know, without actually having to reach out to the people and talk to them individually, I got a sense of kind of what was happening out there. So it was kind of fun in that way. Because uh, normally there's not like a, a Yelp for like malware reviews, you know, like that's, that's kind of what was happening here. 
Um, and the alternative way that they were infecting people was also through TeamViewer, basically remote administration. They'd be tell the user to, hey, run TeamViewer or, or a really fun other extension called Chrome Remote Desktop, which is uh, also really handy, and uh, basically lets them log into your computer remotely as well. And from there, they probably would do additional verification and then manually do some ad platform stuff and then also install a backdoor as well. So some of Google's mitigations is uh, basically you can report in terms of the web stores. You can report these. You can give them low ratings. But you're playing a game of whack-a-mole. They, they turn these copycat things out real quick. Um, it is somewhat of a s slow process. I didn't, I didn't make an effort to reach out to any specific person at Google. I just kind of went through the normal report abuse platform. So I guess it just has to get sucked into that system and eventually it gets sorted out. Uh, but I think from a, from a user standpoint, a lot of times people have a false sense of security when they go to the Chrome store because they may have an impression of a sort of walled garden thing that, oh, if, well, it's here, it's on, hosted on the Google site. Kind of the same issue you have with a lot of Android apps, possibly, uh, where people just have a false sense of security because it's coming from the, the platform. Uh, Facebook mitigations. One important thing to know here is um, Facebook actually does require additional authorization for issues of national importance, which is this laundry list of issues you see on this slide. And basically, it's anything that could be considered controversial in a political or national scale. And to actually go through that process, uh, to pr 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 post ads like that, you need to, uh, they have rules in place in the US, UK, Brazil, and Nigeria specifically. And you need to have two factor authentication enabled. You need to provide them a picture of your government issued ID and a, and a mailing address in the, in the country that you're advertising in. And interestingly enough, when I first did this research, they also require your last four digits of your social security number. I checked again last night and they took that off the page, right? So whatever, it's a, it's a work in progress. But either way, I'm glad that there's some process there. That said, um, you have, for 21 days after this, uh, you're able to post those ads, but you have, eventually you have, you get a code in the mail that you have to put in that they verify you, re you receive mail at this mailing address. Uh, and this is Facebook's response from one of the uh, product managers on their ads team. Uh, uh, Craig Silverman from BuzzFeed was kind enough that after he saw my abstract, he was really interested as well, and he reached out to them uh, on my behalf as well, uh, and, and they basically gave a response that they're aware of the issue and they're, they're kind of they're working on it. Some final thoughts. Uh, from an industry standpoint, there's kind of a conflict of interest here a little bit where engagement is effectively profit in, in the social media space, right? So there's a, there's a tricky balance here where uh, you know, companies need to manage integrity and income because that's really what you're managing. The more, you know, obviously whenever an ad goes up, they make more money, but every time the users feel like the integrity is, is dropping, then it reduces their long-term prospects. And I think that companies are starting to realize that the, the less people trust their platforms, the more that affects their long-term bottom line. In the short term, it's, it's all profit. Um, from a user perspective, it's interesting that there's now kind of this transactional relationship with some of these criminal groups where it used to just be, you know, users in the past may have been seen like lemons or limes where you just, you harvest them, you squeeze them dry, and you throw the husk out, right? Now it's, it's more of like a cow that you milk for a few weeks and then you butcher them afterwards, you know? So, <laughs> and, and, and these relationships, like they're compensating them with, you know, whether it's, it's likes or in this case, you know, money or influence, right? A lot of times in the Instagram world, for example, they'll be like, hey, give us your Instagram login information and we'll put you in this like giant Instagram botnet where we'll make you like things, but then everyone likes your stuff too, you know? Um, I don't know, it's almost like, a, like, like a social media communism. Like everyone's just like trading things without any sense of actually liking things or not, I don't know. And anyway, so uh, yeah, criminals, uh, have two approaches now. They have the, the, stand, the, the old phishing method, and now it turns out they can bribe users with surprising efficiency. And this actually gets the job done a lot of the times. And in the case of Facebook accounts specifically where you have, you know, uh, you have to have an investment into creating these fake accounts, uh, it's actually worthwhile for them to just pay off a user, burn their account, and not have to worry about it at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's users, terms of service. They don't care. They want free money. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Oh, I'm out of time. All right. Well, you can ask me questions online or at, uh, on Twitter or offline. Thanks.